Hello and welcome everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to our UN World Data Forum session on data to leave no one behind in the context of COVID-19, where we'll be looking at practical steps to apply data to leave no one behind. Um, with some examples from Benin and beyond. We've got a fantastic panel ready and waiting for you. But before we start, um, I just want to thank our co-hosts, the Ministry of Planning and Development at Benin, uh, and go over a few housekeeping rules for you. So um, we're using Zoom for the webinar today. If you wish to ask a question, can you please ask it through Zoom uh, rather than the attend Attendify platform so that we can monitor your chat all in one place. Uh, you can use the function to raise your hand um, and type your question in the chat box, but please include your name. And remember, once you've asked your question, to take your hand down so that we, we know that uh, we've come to you already. Uh, you'll be on mute, uh, but if we want to bring you in to ask your question live, you will be invited to unmute and the moderator will bring you in. And lastly, just before we start, a reminder that this event is being recorded um, and will be shared publicly following the session on the Attendify platform where you can continue to join in the chat. So please join in the discussion. Looking forward to discussing this really important topic with you. And I would like to uh, introduce our fantastic moderator, Hai Shan Fu, who is the Director of Development Data at the World Bank. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Hai Shan. Uh, I don't seem to be able to make the video work, but uh, I hope that we can connect through my voice. It, it is really my great pleasure to join you all as a moderator for this session and welcome you all to, to this designed to be a very interactive discussion. I just want to start by really emphasizing what a critical time for us to discuss this leaving no, no one behind agenda. We are really deep in what our chief economist called a pandemic recession, which is a wide ranging cascading uh, impact. We know that the current crisis has stopped two decades of steady progress towards eradicating extreme poverty. My colleagues has predicted based on most recent data that up to 88 to 150 million people might be pushed into extreme poverty this year. So we can certainly see that this ongoing crisis has further exposing inequalities and exacerbating vulnerabilities. And uh, this is not just across countries, but also within countries. And uh, those most vulnerable are least resilient to such crisis and are being hit the hardest. So this is really a time for us to really not to lose sight of what we need to focus on and those people who are most in need for our support. This is also a time when the government and international communities are working together to respond to the crisis, to look at our past towards recovery and re rebuild. Data are becoming more important than ever. We need data not to just monitor trends and disruptions. We, we also need data to help us design programs and policies and evaluate the impact of those policies and uh, uh, programs and course correct. At the same time, we also need data that will allow us to pursue targeted local actions and to target individuals who are most in need of help. So this is where not only we need data from public sector, those foundational data produced by government statistical systems, we also need to build new partnership with private sector to leverage those new data sources. At the same time, to really foster innovation in order for us to get the right kind of data for us to really address the issue of leaving no one behind. So this is why we have this fantastic event organized or co-hosted by Development Initiatives and the government of Benin. In this panel discussion, we will have five fabulous uh, speakers they will share their experiences in assessing the impact of COVID-19 on the most vulnerable people. 
and sharing with us the practical approaches to use data and statistics to help address some of the most pressing challenges. And also in terms of how they have been developing new partnership for us to work together. At the same time, to look at some of the impact of the policy responses. So let's get started uh, with, with this uh, discussion. Um, before I invite our speakers, uh, let's start with uh, two videos from the government of Benin. I understand the senior minister, um, uh, Mr. Zhang Ne, is uh, unfortunately not able to join us, but we're very happy to have two other senior officials from the government um, to share with us some key messages. One is Mr. Agassi, Director General in the Ministry of Planning and Development, and Mr. Hausa, Director General of the National Institute of Statistics and Economic Analysis of Benin. So let's hear from them. Je voudrais tout d'abord souhaiter la bienvenue à tous les participants et aux distingués intervenants. C'est pour le Bénin un plaisir et un honneur de co-organiser cet événement intitulé « Des données pour ne laisser personne de côté » dans le cadre de la COVID-19, étape pratique du Bénin et au-delà, avec Development Initiative. Son Excellence, le ministre d'État chargé du plan de développement Aboulay Biotchane s'excuse de ne pouvoir être parmi vous et tient à féliciter tous les organisateurs pour cette table ronde qui devient encore plus utile dans le contexte de la COVID-19. En effet, la COVID-19 a bouleversé toute la planification et toutes les statistiques. Ce genre de crise exacerbe la vulnérabilité des populations et impacte sévèrement aussi bien les pauvres que ceux en transition entre la pauvreté et la non-pauvreté. Le gouvernement du Bénin, avec à sa tête le président Patrice Talon et à ses côtés le ministre d'État chargé du plan de développement, a essayé de réagir de manière adéquate à cette crise en prenant des mesures à court, moyen et long terme afin de contenir les effets socio-économiques et de relancer durablement l'économie. Il convient à cette étape de saluer Development Initiative qui a aidé le Bénin, avec le soutien de la Suisse, à réaliser une étude visant la réduction de l'écart entre les P20 et le reste de la population, suivant le principe ne laisser personne de côté. Il est indéniable que les résultats de cette étude nous seront d'une un, grande utilité dans ce contexte de crise sanitaire mondiale comme celle de la COVID-19. Distingués invités, chers participants, chers organisateurs, je voudrais, au nom du ministre d'État chargé du plan de développement, vous réitérer les remerciements du gouvernement de son excellence, le président Patrice Talon. Restons engagés et solidaires pour la production des données fiables, indispensables à une meilleure prise de décision. Je vous remercie. Intervenez dans le même sens que mon collègue Agassi. Euh, je pourrais vous dire qu'au Bénin, avant que le gouvernement en ne prenne des mesures adéquates pour atténuer les effets de la crise sanitaire, l'Institut national de la statistique et de l'analyse économique, sous l'impulsion du ministre d'État, chargé du plan et du développement, a conduit plusieurs opérations de collecte et d'analyse des données. Et les deux enquêtes réalisées dans le cadre de l'analyse des impacts de la COVID ont permis, entre autres, d'appréhender le niveau de vulnérabilité des ménages et des entreprises, ainsi que des nouvelles habitudes développées pour endiguer la propagation du virus, sans oublier les besoins de ces unités statistiques. Sur la base des résultats de ces enquêtes-là, 
que nous avons versé aux travaux qui ont été faits au niveau euh, de, de l'État, les décisions ont été prises. Et ces décisions ont permis euh, de venir en appui euh, non seulement aux entreprises formelles, mais aussi aux entreprises informelles, mais aussi à la couche sociale euh, la plus défavorisée. Ce travail nous a révélé que notre euh, appareil statistique euh, a beaucoup de défis à, ré, à, à relever. Euh, puisque nous n'avons pas pu faire l'enquête directement auprès des ménages, une partie a été faite directement, mais une bonne partie a été faite fait par téléphone. Et donc, euh, on a vu que nous avons le défi de la numérisation euh, ou de la digitalisation de notre système euh, d'enquête, notre système de collecte d'informations. Je voulais aussi euh, profiter pour inviter les partenaires techniques et financiers à vraiment nous aider, nous aider à, à, remettre, à, à remettre notre appareil statistique euh, sur des, un sentier de développement. Nous avons engagé depuis quelques temps des réformes. Ces réformes sont en train de prendre, mais ces réformes ont besoin d'être soutenues euh, de manière technique, de manière financière, et surtout des matériels. Nous avons besoin de matériel euh, euh, digne de ce nom pour pouvoir nous permettre de faire face à, à certaines réalités, à certains défis qui se, qui se présentent à nous. Voilà ce que je peux dire rapidement par rapport à, à cette intervention. Merci. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Agassi and Mr. Onsa. This is really uh, very inspiring words to hear from you. So now let's move to our panel discussions. Um, we, what we'll do is that we will have two segments of the panel discussions. First, I will in invite two of our panelists um, to share some of their insights. First, I will invite Ms. Harpender Kalekot, the Executive Director of the Development Initiatives, and Dr. Chris Mugiza, Executive Director of Uganda Bureau of Statistics. First, I will start with uh, Harpender. You know, this session is really a follow-up to a recent event uh, Development Initiative has organized, really helping to uh, track the impact of COVID-19, especially on those people who are most vulnerable, in order to ensure that while we're designing our response to the crisis, we're leaving no one behind. So in that context, um, could you really share with us uh, about the, the, the findings, the assessment of, of your team on where are the people and places most likely to be left behind and what impact is COVID-19 having on them? Thank you, Haishan, and thank you so much for moderating this timely panel. It's a pleasure to join you all today and be part of this excellent panel on the first day of the World Data Forum. So Haishan, as you say, we convened a group of senior representatives uh, in July, back in July of this year. They came from government, international organizations and civil society to discuss some of the challenges that COVID presented to people and places most risk of being left behind. And the majority of participants actually surprisingly all agreed that they expected the recovery from this pandemic to take at least five to 10 years and that the impact would be greatest on the poorest people, both globally, but also within countries. And most recent World Bank figures have recently confirmed this prediction. They now estimate that COVID-19 is likely to push anywhere between 88 and 150 million people into extreme poverty this year alone. Now, this is the most dramatic reversal of poverty reduction we have seen in the last three decades. The IMF predictions are, are of a similar vein. They are predicting economic calamity that will make uh, that will result in the world economy shrinking by 4.4% this year. And our own recent analysis has shown that some of the changes are already beginning to occur, particularly with aid commitments that are already reducing. Commitments from bilateral donors, key bilateral donors, have been lower in the first seven months of 2020 than they were in 2019. And this is an impact, a knock-on impact of the, uh, of the economic slowdown that we're seeing in all, the, uh, all of our countries. And it's in this context that I'd like to stress that leaving behind uh, people just cannot 
be at high on the agenda. It really needs to be the primary focus of all policy and funding decisions. If we are to ensure that the response to the, the pandemic really stands a chance of making progress. So the traditional development initiatives fashion, we, we went ahead and looked at the data to actually look at who's been most impacted by the pandemic. And to put it bluntly, global poverty data just isn't timely enough or disaggregated enough to give the national governments and local service providers the information they need to tackle the problems in real time. Understanding the immediate impacts on countries and people most at risk of being left behind is nearly impossible from global data sets and traditional surveys. So what we've done is we've looked at some of the projections from the latest data sets to give you an idea, but then I'm going to drill down a little bit looking at some other uh, data sets that we have used instead. And one thing I can say for sure is that the, the list of countries most risk of, of missing out on global progress hasn't really changed. Many of those who are most likely to let, be left behind will continue to be concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa. COVID-19 is sig not significantly changing the distribution of poverty, but rather it's compounding it. And our analysis shows that, that in virtually every country, the poorest people are projected to see their incomes drop the most. However, countries that are already experiencing high rates of poverty are generally expecting to suffer worse than countries where poverty was already, already relatively low. So the countries most likely to be left behind are also the ones that then lack strong data resources and robust data systems, as we've just been hearing from Benin, where they pointed out that technical, financial and equipment resources are on the low side. So there's a lack of, of foundational data systems in many of these countries, such as CRVS, which is so essential, for example, to produce good quality, robust, comprehensive death registration systems. And we know how important it is to understand where deaths are happening across the country and what the causes of those deaths are as well. And COVID-19 has exposed the limitations of official data on people at a time when it's needed most. And what I'm really surprised about is how little progress in some of these countries have been made since 2015 to improve the quality of disaggregated data to increase our ability to count those who are the furthest behind. So we find that many governments are now flying blind in, in, in this pandemic and the financial investments that were needed to improve data systems have just not happened fast enough. So we must prioritize two things right now. Number one is to ensure that the commitment to leave no one behind needs to be embedded in policy and programming as countries seek to build back better. And secondly, foundational data systems need to be a priority for governments. But in the meantime, we know that there are many impressive efforts going on uh, uh, to plug the data gaps through other, other mechanisms, technology and, and uh, innovations, and many of them will be showcased at this forum. But one example that I particularly wanted to pick up on was the World, World Bank uh, approach, which is using high frequency, uh, frequency phone surveys to track the responses to the social economic impacts of COVID-19 in seven countries specifically. And we looked at the data emerging from Nigeria through these, through these surveys, and it shows how COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting the poorest households. For example, many, many of the Nigerian households reported an increase, uh, a, sorry, a decrease in household income but those living in the poorest 20% of households were the ones who were seeing a much slower rate of improvement since April than the rest of the population. Secondly, women and girls were more likely to report losing their jobs and children living in the poorest 20% of households who are already less likely to engage in learning activities at home. So they saw their rates of learning drop even lower than the rest of the population, which remained pretty consistent. So what does this mean for all of us at the, at the World Data Forum? Well, we know, and we've had, had it mentioned on multiple panels already, that better data is key to effective response and recovery. But it's also critical that the response is locally led. It's nationally and globally coordinated and connected, but it has to be locally led. And for local leadership to be effective, it needs to have access to good information based on the latest real-time data. 
The need has never been greater and we need to think how we can urgently work with local communities to identify the data gaps and support them to fill them. So I've got three things that I think will be useful for us to be doing right now to support local communities to fill these data gaps. Firstly, building trusted multi-stakeholder partnerships across sectors and institutions is essential to harness new technology and other approaches that can fill these data gaps. Secondly, we must embed the principles of leaving one behind in all policy and programmes as we plan and respond to recovery. Thirdly, as I've said, empowering national and local actors to lead the response is going to be critical. They are the best position to know what is needed for their communities. But none of this is possible without sustained investments in foundational data systems. And that must remain a critical focus if we are to ensure that no one is left behind. Thank you, Haishan. Thank you so much. So I, I really appreciate your sharing our, uh, with us those insights and particularly in emphasizing how important it is for us to continue to scale up of investment in the foundational data system, which is really critical as we have seen from throughout this crisis. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank development uh, initiatives for having been the passionate and steady voice in calling on the international community to focus on the leaving no one behind agenda to, re uh, to really um, uh, stay with the spirit of the SDG agenda. Now let's go to Chris, uh, who is the representative of the chief statisticians of developing countries. Chris, uh, as we, we have seen that this crisis uh, has also widened the global data gaps across countries and posing enormous challenges for national statistical systems. But at the same time as um, uh, 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 Harbinder also mentioned that many countries have really making tremendous efforts effort to step up to step up to these uh, challenges and to innovate and build new partnerships. Could you share with us a bit, bit of your experience in Uganda, how you have been responding to the COVID-19 data needs to especially address the need for people who are really vulnerable and uh, in, in deep um, uh, need for help. Uh, thank you, moderator. I will first apologize. My internet is not strong, so I will just speak. I hope you are listening to me. As you've already introduced me, I'm the Chief Statistician of Uganda Bureau of Statistics, and I will be presenting how the country has coped in the context of the COVID-19, the mechanisms we have put in place, and some few key findings. I, I have a big slide, I have a big PowerPoint of 15 slides, but I request that the organizers will share with participants later on. I will make summaries just. Am I being heard? Yes, we can hear you. Please go, okay. go on. Thank you. Thank you. To start with the foundation is uh, that in Uganda, we developed a third national strategy for statistical development that we refer to as plan for national social development that covers all that is very inclusive and is to be implemented for the next five years in line with the national development plan and the SDG data requirements. We, in order to cover everybody, leaving nobody behind, we've developed a national strategy for the development of gender statistics and also published the gender issue reports in 2019. That report also gives profiles for sectors where the gender issues are covered, most notably agriculture, energy, and mining. We've also developed a comprehensive national studies indicator that addresses the challenges and the issues for SDGs and the national plan. Well, the, the other issues are that we have also 
undertaken functional disability survey, governance, peace and, search and security survey, and most recently we conducted two surveys to establish the impact of COVID-19. One focusing on households and the other one focusing on business establishments. And we've disseminated these findings on the national dialogue via EF conference, where the theme was the role of quality statistics in national government and post-COVID-19 recovery in Uganda. Where well, the findings from the household survey are telling. One major finding was that we found out that there was slightly lower knowledge about the preventive me 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 methods of COVID-19 in low areas compared to urban areas. In addition, there was lower knowledge of the preventive measures of COVID-19 in the poorest households compared to the less and non-poor households. The same knowledge was the education level. Those who had no education up to primary do not have enough information compared to their counterparts who achieved secondary education and higher. Now, the most telling thing here, we know that washing hands with soap and clean water is one of the methods to prevent COVID-19. Now, on national level, 17.7% do not access soap. In terms of the urban and rural, 19.9%, rural folks, compared to 13.1%, do not access soap. For water, the numbers are negligible, they are below 1%. So, apparently, in the country, there is sufficient water in the households, but soap was lacking. Now, in terms of the quintile rows, the rows quintile, which is quintile one, 30.1% of the households cannot access soap. Whereas the highest quintile is only 9.1%. So now this suggests that COVID may not be mitigated within the lowest two quintile rows. Another important finding from our phone survey we conducted together with World Bank was the share of households not able to buy medicine or access medical treatment when they need the services. So for rural areas, 36% of the households that required medicine could not access them during the period of April to June. Whereas in the urban 26% of households that required the medicine could not access them due to lockdown. And the national average was 33%. And those who, saw, who, who sought treatment but could not get them in urban areas were 15% compared to their counterparts in rural of 21%. And overall, 19% of the households in the country that require the treatment of any ailment could not access the medical treatment and so forth. Now, we also conducted the phone survey on businesses to establish the impact of the economic activity. And overall, the gross output went down by 20.7% in the month of April only. And the same month, 29.4% of businesses closed operations. And during the same period, 51.5%, that is more than one in two, 
establishments reduced their payroll size as a result of the lockdown. And it's interesting to note that of those that shut down, the biggest activities that suffered were wholesale, retail, repair of motor vehicles and motorcycles, accommodation, food services, and other activities plus construction. And this is where the lowest quintile group is employed. Uh, so, those which operated during the COVID-19 reduced to 70% compared to the pre-COVID outbreak in March. And now, on the again business sphere, the output we already said it shrunk by 51% and manufacturing shrunk by around 60% and only 40% didn't suffer any reduction. So you can see, now we are also conducting the household survey to establish the poverty effects pre-COVID and post-COVID. We had already conducted the surveys up to March. And then during the lockdown, we had a lot of two, three months, we resumed in June. So we shall be able to establish the number of households that they were living below the poverty line pre-COVID-19 and those that are within the poverty line or above after COVID-19. And the results will be shared after yeah. the report is ready in November. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chris. The, the, thank thank you. you so much for sharing with us, uh, you know, your tremendous effort on the ground. And uh, it, it, it's, it's really wonderful to see that you have initiated all kinds of in, uh, programs in order to help uh, as further assess the COVID uh, impact, but also looking towards uh, post-COVID uh, reco uh, recovery. Um, just, just you, you just really make it very clear that uh, functioning uh, foundational government data system is critical, critical in such a uh, situation. And as one of our participants commented uh, in the chat, this crisis has also taken us a step forward in leveraging more uh, administrative data and make sure this administrative data will be key information, especially during the hard times of pandemic. So it's really about how we can work together to continue to strengthen the national data system. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, with that, before I move to the next panel, um, uh, by the way, everyone, uh, Chris' uh, uh, presentation will be shared with you uh, after this uh, event. So um, I, I apologize for not being able to connect him uh, with him through video. But before we move on uh, to our next panel, let's just spend a few minutes to just hear from our audience. You know what you have seen uh, in your uh, context, the kind of data and statistics that needed most to inform policies um, to uh, tackle poverty and inequality, uh, particularly in response to COVID-19. Um, I understand some of the participants already raised hands. Uh, uh, may I call Dorothy Sharma from International Disability Alliance? I understand you would like to make uh, some comments. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is Doro D uh, from the International Disability Alliance, IDA. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for, for uh, uh, you know, to the organizers uh, for the opportunity to speak uh, or make a small intervention on, 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 on this topic and also, uh, you know, congratulating all the organizers here for, for uh, uh, you know, organizing this, this very important discussion. Uh, as I mentioned, I represent uh, the International Disability Alliance, which is a global alliance of organizations of persons with disabilities. Uh, we work uh, on the implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. 
Um, and I think, uh, you know, I was uh, looking at, uh, at this slide that Harpinder presented and also listening to her, uh, to her presentation. And, you know, it's, it's very interesting to, to know that, uh, you know, that the impact of COVID-19 shows that people who were already marginalized uh, the the impact of poverty has actually been compounded compounded for them, and uh, as we know that persons with disabilities are one of the most uh, you know uh, disproportionately affected uh, population groups uh, when it comes to poverty, and I think if we really talk about data and being able to use this data uh, to inform a policy uh, for COVID nine disability inclusive COVID nineteen response, and I think we should be able to disaggregate all the data that we collect by disability. And uh, I would quickly want to make three points here. One is that, you know, it's very important to not just make sure that the questions that we ask generally for the entire population or the respondent groups also include a disability perspective. For example, if we're collecting data on uh, how the access to education or how access to social protection changed for the respondents, then it's also important to include a component on disability access to those schemes uh, so that even the general questions that we have give us the ability to disaggregate by uh, disability. Uh, the, uh, the other point is, uh, which is also very important, is to be able to ask questions which are specifically related to disability. For example, you know, people have disability linked expenses, uh, which also, uh, you know, basically uh, make uh, the impact of poverty uh, or the lack of income or the lack of social protection uh, more uh, pronounced for perceived disabilities. So, you know, we should be able to ask questions related to disability uh, specific expenses, such as access to assistive technology or being able to afford a personal assistant or even having to uh, uh, use private transportation because uh, the uh, public transportations were shut down or food requirements for that matter or, uh, you know, uh, health related costs. Uh, so those two uh, components are quite important. The, and last point I would want to make is that um, the data collection process itself also needs to be accessible for persons with disabilities. We need to be able to reach uh, persons with disabilities, respondents with disabilities, and we need to be able to make sure that the, the survey process are also accessible to them. It's an, it's an uh, easy to understand language or in a form that people with disabilities can themselves access. Uh, yeah. and, Sorry, so just, uh, yeah, and uh, basically quickly there, uh, you know, it's important to keep in mind Article 31 of this convention uh, when we talk about disability segregation. And I think it's very important to keep that uh, population group in mind when we talk about data to inform yeah. uh, poverty. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you very much, Dorothy, for making such a, a strong case for uh, collecting the, the right data through the right uh, instrument uh, on uh, people with disabilities. And thank you very much. I understand that uh, Alexander uh, Minovit would also like to come in. Could you keep your uh, comments brief so we can move on and you can come back later? Thank you very much, Jan, and thank, uh, thank you uh, to all the, um, all, all the panelists and uh, development initiatives. I guess I just wanted to follow up on um, the, um, Dorothy's uh, comment, and, uh, and, and I think something that Amina Mohammed mentioned, kind of, kind of the data starts at the, uh, at the grassroots level, and uh, I guess to, to, to understand the diversity within the population and diverse needs of, uh, of these various population groups. We, all, we, all, we have to ensure that uh, those groups are actually in, included in, 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 in the process, the, the data process, but the data process actually kind of is centered around um, individuals uh, and um, that there is an opportunity for individuals to participate throughout the, uh, the um, the data, uh, the data production process uh, um, to actually to, to bring out this um, the diversity and um, of the of the population and I also uh, I think in terms uh, maybe some one other point uh, I um, that uh, many of the uh, development and humanitarian frameworks already have a strong language in relation to the inclusion of people with disabilities women older people but it is the issue of putting those commitments into practice, actually uh, ensuring that humanitarian uh, um, uh, assessment actually do deliver, uh, do analyze those uh, yeah. um, 
those groups. And I think it raises a question about, uh, in terms of accountability. I, right. I recognize that there is a resource issue, but it, it also, I think we have to start thinking about accountability yeah. as well. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for making that very important point, Alex. Thank you so much. Now, let's move to our next panel. Uh, now we have uh, three speakers. Um, first is uh, Ms. Karen Michorin, uh, Director General of Social Data Insights, uh, Integration and Innovation Statistics Canada. We also have Professor Oliver Hamberlin from Bern University of uh, Applied Sciences, and also Mr. Oliver Chingana, Chingaya, Director of uh, African Center for Statistics uh, at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. So let's start with Karen. Karen, I know Thanks. that every statistical system had been tested during the COVID. Um, could you share with us your experience in, with Statistics Canada, how you have been responding to the increasing new data needs uh, posed by the COVID-19? Yes, thank and thank you very much, Heishan, and, and it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to be looking a little bit this way because I want to stick to my script so I don't go over my five minutes. Um, so as you know, uh, Statistics Canada for the past few years has been on a modernization journey. We recognize that in order to remain uh, relevant in a data world, we needed to be user-centric, timely, and use modern techniques to reduce the burden we placed on Canadian households and businesses. When COVID hit, the need for timely data was even more magnified. Next highlight, please. On the social statistics side, prior to the pandemic, we had developed a social data platform framework that takes user needs and exploits as much as possible existing admin data, so an admin uh, data first strategy, and data linkages to respond to data needs. Should a survey still be required, we knew that the traditional approach of a 45 minute to a one hour survey in person or uh, by telephone was just not sustainable. We had to do surveys differently. So before COVID, we were well on our way to developing these new tools and methods. Specifically, we had already secured the participation of 7,200 uh, labor force rotate out. So people who had previously participated in our labor force survey to be part of a web panel that was to be to con conducted uh, with various content every two months over a one year per period. And we had that content already lined up. When the pandemic hit, our public health agency needed to know very quickly the extent to which Canadians were following the measures and restrictions being imposed. Our employment and social development department needed to know also quickly the extent to which people's employment was being impacted. Within a week or so, we developed new content that was COVID related for the web panel. Collection was through an electronic questionnaire. We'd already had their, their email addresses and was no more than 10 minutes of content. Collection lasted one week and the data was out one week following collection. So within two weeks, we had results. Our chief statistician also wanted us to go to the broader population quickly. We had some experience with crowdsourcing when we asked about the price people paid for cannabis prior to its legalization in Canada. So we took a, a similar content from our web panel and did a crowdsource. There were no more than 12 questions and include, we included gender, age and postal code so we could adjust the data based on benchmarks we already had at StatsCan. 240,000 Canadians responded after just three weeks that our crowdsource was, uh, was there. Data was out the week after collection stopped. So again, very timely. As the world was changing quickly and the impacts of COVID were widespread, not only in the number of cases, but in the type of impact, we turned new content around every few weeks in our crowdsource using relevant community organizations and associations to promote the crowdsource. In total, we've done eight. For the web panel, we went to our respondents every five weeks and are about to conduct our sixth and last web panel with the current cohort. Early on, we were hearing that vulnerable populations, including racialized populations, were being especially hard hit by the virus and or were being targeted. We adjusted both the web panel and the crowdsource to include a question related to population groups. We also added the population groups question to our labor force supplement survey to better understand the extent to which vulnerable populations employment was being impacted by the virus. Next highlight. As I mentioned, content was changing to both our web panel and crowdsource every few weeks to be responsive to our public health agency and our employment and social uh, development federal departments. Results were clear. 
immigrants, racialized and indigenous Canadians were being stigmatized because of the virus. They were more likely to see their jobs impacted. They reported greater impacts on their mental health and were feeling the financial strain more. Next highlight. There's so much more to learn, gaps remain. The coronavirus has really shone a spotlight on the systemic discrimination in society and the data gaps that exist. Through our Centre for Gender and Diversity Statistics at Statistics Canada, we're hoping to launch a number of initiatives to measure systemic discrimination to address issues in society at large and the impacts of COVID-19 specifically. We are also looking to launch different web panels to better, um, web panels to better see the impacts of COVID and other issues on immigrant and racialized groups. The possibilities are truly endless. I will end here and I'm grateful to be here this morning and look forward to my colleagues' presentations and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, we all know that uh, Statistics Canada is constantly pushing the frontiers and it's really great to see how in this crisis situation you are able to adopt new approaches. Uh, it's, it's, I'm sure that, that there will be a lot of lessons learned and good practices that other countries could learn from. So thank you very much. Now let's let's go to um, our professor Anvelin. You know we know that uh, in order to get better, more real-time data that will allow us to look at uh, you know groups that have been uh, excluded or marginalized uh, or areas that require detailed information, data integration and new data analytics is is critical. Um, I understand that you have been working in, in Switzerland uh, in terms of using um, different kind of data to monitor poverty for small areas. Could you share with us some of your experience and, and uh, lessons learned? Uh, of course. Thank you, Aishan. Um, and uh, thanks for having me in this session. It's a very uh, important session and I hope I can um, share some uh, insights from the Swiss case uh, that are val valuable also for other parts of the country. So um, I mainly will talk about the recent study that we just uh, finished and it addressed not uh, COVID-19 directly but it was more about uh, a proposal on how poverty monitoring in Switzerland should and could be um, improved. And uh, it's summarized with uh, five key messages. And this is the, the first uh, rather general one. So we kind of have like a digitalization and data revolution as a mega trend. And that's a starting point for us. Uh, so we thought about how this could be used uh, to improve um, poverty uh, monitoring. And if you look in more detail in, in Switzerland, I mean, you already have like a kind of a poverty monitoring, but it's designed to capture poverty at the national level. And it's also designed to fit in uh, the concepts within the European Union to get like comparison uh, between countries. Uh, but at the same time, um, poverty policies uh, are mostly designed by subnational actors. So we kind of have like 26 different cantons on a subnational level. They are very important, important um, with respect to poverty uh, policy. Uh, and it's very, therefore very important to have a poverty monitoring uh, on the subnational level. And this is important on the one hand uh, to know more where poor people in Switzerland actually live. And on the other hand, also uh, to know more about the effects of this uh, cantonal poverty policies. Um, if we, yeah, and to fulfill this uh, goal, uh, we say like link register data or administrative data uh, is very essential uh, to get uh, to this point. More concrete, we used um, tax data and linked it to a population and housing register and also uh, to data from uh, social benefits. So we kind of get very rich data with near full population coverage, detailed information on the financial situations of households. And it's also possible to get indicators really on, on the small areas within uh, Switzerland. So, Good data is for sure uh, an important starting point, point. but what should we uh, look at? 
so we propose that's the next key message that uh, that several different indicators um, should be implemented so that we capture different forms um, of poverty and of course we uh, propose to uh, use established indicators it is like a measure for uh, absolute poverty, but also a measure uh, for poverty at risk. Um, but we su suggested also to implement um, some kind of newer uh, indicators. And uh, the last two key messages are about these newer um, indicators. And uh, one of them, the first one, is that we propose that uh, one should also look at the uh, non-take up of uh, social assi assistance to capture those that fall uh, below the poverty line but are not reached by, by the welfare system. Um, so this indicator is important uh, because we think it's not sufficient uh, to kind of have uh, poverty instruments. It's also very important um, uh, to get a measure on if everyone uh, that are entitled to this instrument uh, uh, can take it up and if they don't take it up uh, it should also be investigated uh, why uh, this this happened and uh, the last indicator um, is about uh, p20 um, a p20 indicator and with that indicator uh, the focus is shifted a bit more towards um, inequality uh, it's more concrete, we say one should look at uh, the income of the poorest 20% uh, uh, of, of a region and compare uh, this income to, uh, to the average and also to the top incomes of that region. And then also uh, check on that indi indicator uh, over time because uh, sustainable growth, uh, as we understand it, encompasses that possibly all parts of society should uh, profit from economic growth and also the technological progress. So it can be that you have kind of a prosperous times, but only a minority uh, profits uh, from this economic growth. And uh, by implementing uh, this B20 indicator, uh, we urge politics uh, to have also an eye on that not only the richest profit from, uh, from the developments, but society as a whole and the poorest in particular. And this is it already, I think, within the five minutes. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank Back you to so you, much. Haishan. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, this is really fascinating. I, I'm sure there will be your approach will have uh, wider applications in other contexts. So we're very eager to learn more about this. So now let's move to the other Oliver. Oliver, um, you have been a strong leader in international statistical community and by working in a region that needed the most support. Um, so how do you see in the context of, uh, of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, what, what are the you know, needs from countries that we need to best prepare to, to provide support for? And what are some of the enabling factors you see that critical? that we will need to really collectively focus on. Uh, thank you, Harrison. First of all, uh, thank you to have me on this platform. Uh, let, let me address the question, uh, perhaps looking at five issues. Uh, and first of all, to address really why data is so important. I, I think we all know by now that COVID uh, really has ravaged uh, the core, what one would call the core assets of, of most of the economies. And Africa has not been spared at all. And I would imagine even some of the uh, uh, regional um, developing countries could have be also be facing the same. And what we've also noticed that is that the, the, the whole, what we call a, the social and human fabric has been affected. And it has created a lot of anxiety from everyone, everywhere. And, and data therefore has become a, a core component in the requirement of the citizens not, not the, the governments, development partners, to be able to respond uh, to, to the situation. And, and therefore, if you look at the uh, citizens themselves, they would want information to understand what COVID is about, uh, how it is transmitted, uh, how can the African get treated and so forth, uh, who are the vulnerable and so forth. The government also require information to inform their own uh, uh, planning. They, they need to know where the population is. Uh, and in a, in a continent like Africa, where some of the information of uh, it is scanty in terms of uh, nomads and so forth, becomes really a big problem in allocating 
uh, where the populations are, the demographics of, uh, of those populations, uh, the facilities that are required. Development partners are like equal where we need the information uh, together with the private sector uh, to make similar interventions, but perhaps much more targeted in, in terms of determining what kind of support do the governments require or the citizens or whoever needs uh, support? What kind of tools and capacities that are required to be able to provide uh, the required information in terms of intervening? So add it all, you can actually tell, see that this is all about responding to make sure that no one is actually left behind. And data economy, uh, just to, to emphasize that, data economy with a very robust digitalized ecosystem is critical in this respect. Uh, for decision making. And, and I think that really gets me to the second point that I would like to address is that part of this um, addressing the response is how do we modernize uh, the statistical process to be able to collect and provide information very timely. I, I want to suggest that perhaps what is actually required is developing a two-way uh, transmission of information. Uh, first of all, I think technology uh, that, that allows to share information to the citizens and to the government or the partners that are providing support are critical in my view. And I think the data economy again should be include, should include a two-way uh, exchange. Here I, I'm, I'm talking about the situation where the government is able to provide information to the citizens and citizens are able to, to provide information that is required uh, to, to, to the government to, for, to be able to make the necessary interventions. Now, here in Africa, one of the things that we've done is that ECA, we launched what we call the Africa Communication Information Platform. Part of that platform that we engage the mobile network operators uh, to be able to share information through what I would call the SMSs or the interactive uh, voice response uh, to allow our citizens to be able to receive information that, is, uh, that, is, that they need, as well as for government to be able to pass information to the citizens uh, to, to make the necessary action that is required. And that takes me to the third point. Uh, and this is how do we then engage others that have the tools? I and mean, in this, I'm talking about the private sector themselves uh, to better respond. I think the private sector really have a bigger role uh, in, in the data economy. Uh, and, and, and because they have the capacity, they have the tools that are required. They have access to much bigger data, including big data. Um, and, and especially the use of non-traditional sources uh, which uh, uh, you know is, is the case for most of, of the uh, our national statistical offices. But also, what is also interesting that they have what I would call tested solutions that uh, they would, they would uh, be able to, pro to bring to the table. But here is a win-win situation. Both the private sector wins, as well as the, you know the, the, the government and citizens are also able to win. The private sector are able to benefit by building up their markets in terms of they have much more information and they can increase their market capacity and therefore they have the opportunity to be able to share the information. Government or even the other users also they have access to additional information that is required. Again, here at ECA, what we have done is that we, we launched together with the Global Partners for Sustainable Development, uh, an initiative on data resilience for Africa, which brings several partners uh, to build on the progress that's been made so far to bring the tester solution, the capacity to strengthen the statistical systems, the capacity to contribute effective use of uh, partner resources, and also to be able to share and, and learn experience among it themselves. And finally, um, just to talk about um, what I would call trusted partnership. How do we identify the right people? And I think one of the things that we're trying to do is that bringing together uh, the right partners to work together. Um, uh, and given that you know, in the statistical landscape, as you know, there are many players. There are so many of them. And this is a situation where everyone wants to show that they are experts in data. Uh, the, the ones to show that they have knowledge in, in data and so forth. And, and therefore, there's a need to identify the right people to work with and provide immense support by identifying the right partners uh, uh, in this area. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and perhaps come back uh, when there are questions uh, going forward. Thank you very much, yeah. Thank you so much, Oliver. It's, it's great to see that you're proactively uh, working with uh, GPSDD to, to build bridges with private sector data sources in order to complement the uh, data from national statistical systems. Uh, thank you so much. Um, with that, let's open up for another round of discussion. I, I, I can see there's already a lot of uh, the ideas uh, uh, floating uh, you know, in, the, in the heads of our audience and many of you would like to come in. As, as the second panel has uh, emphasized, not only we need to 
innovate in, in uh, new data solutions uh, to bridge the data gaps to address uh, people uh, leaving no one behind. We also need new partnerships uh, in order to uh, uh, foster sharing and use of alternative data sources. At the same time, international community also have a role to play. So with that, uh, let's see what, what are the um, comments from our participants. Uh, I understand first, Jenna uh, slotting from the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data would like to come in. Uh, could you all keep your uh, uh, comments uh, very succinct? We have only about 10 minutes to go. And many of you would like to speak. Yeah, please, Jenna. Great to have you. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Haishan, for giving me the opportunity to come in. Thanks also, Oliver, um, and all the panelists for your great comments in this really important event today. Um, Oliver highlighted some ways in which the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data is coming and is joining up with the Economic Commission for Africa to create new partnerships around COVID response, particularly with the private sector, and that's incredibly valuable and important. I also wanted to highlight um, um, other, other types of partnerships, particularly an initiative called the Inclusive Data Charter, which really aims to, um, to build political momentum behind the need for more inclusive data and data to leave no one behind. And these challenges around disaggregation that all of the panelists have been speaking about today. And this is um, an approach that brings together countries, international organizations, uh, civil society organizations, and others who sign up to a set of principles around making data more inclusive and better disaggregating data. And then they articulate a very specific bespoke action plan that um, articulates how they're going to put those principles into action. Um, and one of the advantages of having this charter mechanism with the action-driven um, plan um, creates that political momentum and the demand from policymakers to see more inclusive data, which can then be channeled into um, a more targeted response. So just one example I'd like to share from one of our champions, the government of Sierra Leone in their action plan put a real emphasis on education data and using the principles of the inclusive data charter, what they did was they um, used it to guide their work in the education sector um, and to build the political will to get more inclusive data. That allowed them to join up data um, sources from across systems. They added more questions into surveys and their annual school census, um, including on disability, gender, geography, and other dimensions. And among other things, that, you, that helped them to overturn a ban on pregnant girls in school and ensure greater access. So that's just one example. So I just wanted to highlight the uniqueness of that partnership um, as a complement also um, uh, to, the, to what Oliver talked about, because the political dimension and ensuring that the demand for the data is really there um, make, can make a really huge difference to enable the kinds of innovations that we've heard about in terms of using new data sources, in terms of particularly accessing um, and sharing administrative data across the system and linking up those data sources um, and making the drive to disaggregate data um, and get that information about how different groups are faring in their experience with respect to COVID um, and poverty in general um, and other experiences. So thanks so much, Kaisha, yeah. and uh, thank, you. thank you for allowing me to come in on this important yeah. thank discussion. You very, yeah, thank you very much, Jenna. Uh, now I, I see uh, Somia Chattapati. Sorry, I must have uh, pronounced your name wrong, but please come in. All right, maybe we're not, you're not unmuted or, okay, how about, um, while we're waiting for you to come in, how about Christina being Ghana from the Nabel? Do I hear you? Are you unmuted? All right. Um, also, I see, um, uh, in the chat, uh, someone was commenting, uh, following our earlier discussion, commenting on the data for people, uh, homeless and street connected population. Yeah, so why don't we invite you to, Shona, you want to quickly come in? Shona, Mike Colloy. 
Hello, this is Soumya Chattopadhyay from ODI. Okay, sure. Yeah, please. Yeah, now we can hear you. Good, good. I'm okay. glad. Please Thank come you. in. Thank you. Uh, so at ODI, I mean, I'll be very brief. Uh, we've been sort of looking at it from a think tank's perspective, which is using existing data, but also channelizing into what actually delivers in terms of giving meaningful guidance to countries or operate or, or stakeholders in terms of leaving no one behind. And uh, so it is something that we developed called the Leave No One Behind Index. And this is the fourth year we are doing. It's an annual index. It, it can be tailored for COVID because COVID actually has just exposed or widened the sort of fissures in the sort of uh, the marginalized even further. So we have sort of mm -hmm. undone some of the gains of the last couple of decades. And so it, it just heightens the sort of necessity, but it's, I mean, one point I would, would like to make is the co that while COVID has exposed some of these fissures, even beyond what we already knew existed. But our approach towards using this should not just be a one shot sort of strategy. It gives us an opportunity to kind of build robust mechanisms because this leave no one behind as a concept, as a sort of policy and a practice tool extends and should extend beyond the sort of ramifications of COVID. And so what, I mean, my, my suggestion to the sort of community of stakeholders is to kind of while building data gathering systems which actually address and highlight the gaps we should also sort of think a little longer term in terms of saying what is relevant beyond this pandemic and the public health response and to build robust systems which actually can generate sort of meaningful insight and policy guidance up until 2030 and perhaps beyond. Yeah. I'll, I'll just leave it at yeah. that and uh, can respond to other questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I know there are a lot of interest, and but we are a bit running out of time. So I just urge everyone to be very brief. Um, uh, how about Christina? I know that you yes. were, yeah, please come in very okay. briefly, please. Yes, sure. Uh, great opportunity to join uh, this discussion. So I'm Christina Bangana from Enable, um, the Belgian Development Agency, and I'm here uh, to, from a perspective from evaluation, um, to present you some findings from uh, a real-time evaluation on Enable's response uh, to COVID-19 in the 14 uh, partner countries. So. Um, the evaluation started uh, very quickly as this, the, the crisis, the pandemic started uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, we were interested in, in three objectives. First, to assess the effects uh, of the crisis uh, in our, um, with, uh, on our partner countries and uh, also on the organization. Then also assess the adaptability of the organization and, to pro and what response was provided in the 14 countries through also looking at more into detail uh, through three case studies, including Benin, uh, DRC, and Niger, and to assess relevance of the, the response, as well as looking at overall the coherence of the response. So uh, <laughs> if to respond to the question, so what should be the role um, of the international community to support uh, better data collection and use? Uh, and from our experience, and, and right now we're still doing the, the evaluation, <clears throat> not yet finalized, but we have some nice findings all at this point. What we have uh, in terms of uh, lessons learned, um, one of the role is really to, um, that we found uh, interesting to share is yeah. to enable, basically to enable and strengthen capacities of national institutions for better data. Yeah. We have examples in DRC, Burundi and Senegal, in which uh, we supported the Ministry of Health um, in digitalization uh, of their health information system. And um, so this has yeah. been key to ensure continuity and availability of health data at different levels during the crisis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Christina, quick, so that I can give a couple of others the chance. We have only okay. about two minutes, one minute left. All right. Yeah. So I have just three more uh, lessons learned that I would like to share. Uh, building a strong relationship with national institutions and, and 
and also the presence of, uh, of, of the donor in decentralized uh, offices in country allowed us to get real-time context-specific information and data on national and local needs in time of crisis. S second lesson, support to local organization in the creation and use of new uh, digital solution can be a, a way to improve data quality. Some examples were yeah. mentioned uh, here. And the last one, so the use of standard indicators uh, linked to SDGs um, by the partner countries uh, is a way to harmonize data collection and results with okay. disaggregation by age, sex, disability regions, as Dorothy said, to be able to, jo to identify groups that might be uh, left behind. And we yeah. have a number of uh, interesting examples, but I see that yeah. there is no yeah. time to share. Wait, there is really, really no time. Um, but but we can have a follow-up uh, discussions and you could also share those detailed information. Now, let me just give uh, the following two people each 30 seconds. Niraja from uh, data to x you have 30 seconds to make your pitch. And also yes. Richard, Richard, yeah, please go ahead. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of the, the panelists and everything we've heard today. Um, I just really, uh, from data to access perspective, we really focus on gender data. So I wanted to thank the number of people who kind of made that call to disaggregation and to intersectionality um, and the incredible importance of thinking about this, uh, the different impacts for different um, populations. Um, and I also wanted to tie back to a couple of the comments to think beyond health and beyond the sort of immediate impacts of the pandemic. Um, so for example, we see that women are dropping out of the workforce at a much higher rate than men um, due to sort of the, the secondary burdens um, of, of household responsibilities that they face. So as we're thinking about data systems, it really does need to go beyond um, what we've seen so far and to, to kind of really tie into what are those economic impacts, which are going to be much more long term. Um, what are those those I yeah. see in the comments, housing, education, et cetera. So what are all those impacts and how do we build yeah. the systems to address those questions um, for for the many years to come that we'll be kind of dealing with this? Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, thank you. I know there are a lot of interest, but we're really running out of time. Uh, Richard Hasson, if you have just 15 seconds to make one message. Okay, thank you so much for all of us. Uh, one second, one message. I would encourage each of us to, to go to uh, Afrobarometer websites. There are a lot of data sets there on the view of citizens in Africa on uh, live poverty, health, education. So those information, those data can help uh, to go uh, debate about COVID-19. Yeah. Thank you. Th thank you so much. Now, I just, I, I know there's still a lot to be discussed and, and I, I thank the development initiatives and the government of Benin for hosting this event. We, we, we need to organize more of such discussions, but I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you, the panelists and all the participants. There's just so much to be done uh, to ensure that no one will leave behind, left behind. Claudia. Final remarks, sorry. Thank you so much. As always happens with these really, really rich discussions, you get going just at the end. And unfortunately, uh, the UN uh, Attendify platform will cut us off. Otherwise we could stay and discuss with you longer. Um, I wanted to apologize in particular to Shona who had a really excellent question in the chat about whether, how we can um, pick up groups who are traditionally missing from data, like the homeless. Uh, so Shona, we're going to be posting that question on the Attendify chat, and I hope some of our panelists can come back and answer that for you to see, uh, see whether there are any innovative ways uh, our colleagues in the stats offices are looking to include those missing populations. I wanted to pick up just a few key themes. Um, the first was the absolute need to invest in those foundational data systems to ensure that we're counting everyone. And the fact that it isn't just about disaggregated data, it's about inclusive data and also transparent data and transparent financing for data. Another great point in the chat from James Holton there. Thank you very much. Um, and some really great innovative approaches coming out from web panels to crowdsourcing to the use of online surveys. Um, but the real need to think about a pathway to better data systems. We shouldn't just be thinking about answering the questions that COVID-19 is presenting, but looking much more longer to 2030 and how we can build the foundational systems for that. Thank you all so much.
like I said, I think we could um, have at least another hour, couldn't we, Hai Shan? Thank you. Very <laughs> yes. Much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all very much. Take care and stay safe. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye.